Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I wish I could be with you all today. I'm coming to you uh, live from Cambridge, Massachusetts here in my office. I know you've just had your afternoon coffee. I'm having my uh, morning coffee. So um, again, apologies for not being able to be there, but um, hopefully we can still have a conversation. And I'm excited actually uh, to read the program and, and to talk with you and, and to hear about your work and, and hopefully some of the work that I've done uh, in my team will, will be useful. So what I'd like to talk about today is in the title, The Implications of Everyday Urban Mobility for Structural Connectedness, Inequality, and Well-Being in Contemporary Cities. Most of this research is going to focus on American cities, but at the end I'll talk about what I think are implications for kind of a global um, set of studies on urban inequality and connectedness. So as was noted in the uh, introduction, a lot of my work stems from a particular project in Chicago, the Project on Human Development in Chicago Neighborhoods. I'm not gonna get into details on this. Uh, I've been working with this study really since 1995, actually a little bit earlier. We followed five waves of children, just collected data um, at the end of November in 2021, and hasn't been published yet. Uh, we followed neighborhoods, multiple method investigations of neighborhoods. A recent publication in the bottom right of the screen, happy to send it to anyone who asks, uh, describes the entire study. It's really a cohort uh, profile, um, open access. W what I'd like to do, though, is to really kind of focus on a particular aspect of this project, and that's the, the neighborhood level focus. And it was, as Andreas noted in the introduction, my last book was called Great American City, Chicago and the Enduring Neighborhood Effect. A lot of my research and a lot of research over the last century on neighborhoods is focused on what you might think of as the internal characteristics of neighborhoods. And even the map, uh, kind of the mosaic, if you will, of Chicago that you can see in the cover of the book, looks at neighborhoods and almost implies that they're self-isolated entities. But of course, we know that's not true. There's been research looking at spatial proximity. But what I think has happened, there's a blossoming of research, and you're talking about it there, on how neighborhoods are connected through mobility. I started to think about this, and in the last section of the book, I had a section called Neighborhood Networks and the Higher Order Structure of the City. And what I meant was to really make an argument, theoretical and empirical argument about social structure, not just individuals, but how individuals through their actions and movements create a larger social structure, kind of an emergent uh, property as it were. And in this particular, graph in the book, the circles are neighborhoods. And I was looking at people moving over time, literally moving homes and residents, particularly if they cross boundaries of neighborhoods. As you can see, residential mobility creates ties or the lack thereof in the larger metropolis. And I began to formalize that more and looked at the relationship between network structure based on mobility and other phenomena. But what I'd like to do now is really kind of me too where you are, I think, and that is going from static characteristics, or in my case, residential mobility, to everyday urban mobility. And it's really, um, I think, easy to, to, to see this, and let me see if this is possible, um, to give you an example. This is in Boston, an example of urban mobility. Just one person is going to start out in the bottom right of your screen. This is a person who lives down um, in southeast Boston. And you can see their travel over, in this case, a period of 18 months. There's a time stamp up in the left. It's uh, going all times of the day. And this person is concentrated sort of around where they live. But you can see a lot of movement into the central part of Boston into downtown up near just north of uh, Logan Airport, where some of you may have spent time. The key here is that we do not just live in our neighborhoods. This is just one person, but it's representative. That's why uh, we pulled this one person, sort of the average number of neighborhoods visited. But what you can see in this map is that the visited neighborhoods, at least in the city, are only a sample of, of neighborhoods. That is, there's a lot of non-connectedness and these characteristics are um, important, we think. And I'm gonna expand this now and tell you a little bit about some of those studies. These are based on a specific kind of data that have limitations, but let me go over it first and then move on to another kind of data. 
when he looked at that person moving around, we can think about three characteristics, or at least we argued, in a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences with a group of postdocs and a faculty colleague here. Three characteristics. How far do people travel when they travel? How many neighborhoods do they visit? And what kinds of neighborhoods do they visit? Which is really perhaps the most interesting question. Using a data source I'll describe in a second, on the right, I'm showing you New York City, in particular, a person who lives in Manhattan here near my cursor, the blue box. This particular person seems to travel a lot and likes lower Manhattan, downtown, you know, down here, Greenwich Village and so forth. Seems not to like Queens so much or the Bronx or Brooklyn. Maybe he or she does, but they certainly do not visit there, have no contact there. Nothing up here, a little bit into New Jersey. So you can see that there's a uh, distinct nature here. And this person's travel indicates these three characteristics. That is to say, we can see the number of neighborhoods. We can figure out how far they travel on average, and then we can find out what the characteristics are. So how do we do this? Well, this was back now because the research on urban mobility has just exploded in recent years. We began this project looking at um, geocoded tweets. I'm not a Twitter user. I'll say that right now. I don't really even like it. That said, uh, there are some advantages of it, particularly in the quote, early years, which isn't that long ago, 2013 to 2015, uh, um, geocoded tweets were more reliable for reasons I can talk about later. And what we did was to use machine learning and a massive amount of data, about 650 million tweets. We clustered uh, through spatial uh, clustering algorithms to estimate home locations. And then uh, we identified the centroid to take that home location, put it in the geographic space and then link it to census data. On the right, you can see an example of New York City. And this is simply the estimated home locations of everyone in our sample from New York City. And, uh, oops, sorry. Um, what you can see, first of all, the boundaries of, of New York are in, in red and Manhattan is right there. You can see how dense it is. This really is meant to show that we seem to do a very good job of estimating relative population. When you compare this to the census data, the densest populations we have out here in New Jersey and the suburbs and sparsely populated areas. But what about the characteristics that I mentioned? We found in that paper, basically no major differences in the distance traveled or the number of neighborhoods visited by race or class in the 50 largest American cities. Now that's a big deal because one of the major theories about urban disadvantage, particularly among poor African-American communities is their isolation from quote, mainstream neighborhoods or let's say neighborhoods with more economic resources. But people from poor neighborhoods or black neighborhoods, white neighborhoods, they're all traveling about the same distance and same number of neighborhoods. But there's a huge difference in the composition of neighborhoods visited. Conceptually, I think this finding can be conceived as racial segregation and economic segregation kind of follows people, right? In other words, we've spent years looking at residential segregation, but when you look at urban mobility, there's a kind of a larger, higher order segregation in the neighborhoods visited. How do we do that? Well, we this is a very simple descriptive figure um, it's got some fixed effects for cities and we control for a few characteristics, but basically it's the proportion of visits to non-poor white neighborhoods, which is this left graph. And these are people that live in non-poor white, non-poor black, sort of a classification of race by class. So in other words, it's residential neighborhood type. Now, if you live in a, let's say a metropolitan area, and we use commuting zones here in terms of travel, not just city boundaries. If an well, let's, let's put it this way, uh, extreme example. If you live in a commuting zone that's 100%, let's say, white, well, a random expectation, if you're going to look at it statistically, is it would be visiting 100% 100, 100 of the time, you'd be visiting white neighbors. So we simply took a deviation from what would be expected in the opportunity structure. So zero is the line of equality. It's just a deviation, in other words. And what you can see is that non-poor white neighborhoods are pretty much visiting other uh, 
non-poor white neighborhoods disproportionately. And there's a kind of a, a degree of separation from non-poor, poor black, non-poor Hispanic, tremendous. I mean, it's about a 40% difference. And one key factor here is that there's no difference between non-poor black and poor black, essentially, statistically, in terms of their separation or isolation, which we think is a really interesting fact. In other words, race is really driving these major differences, but there are class differences. So poor whites are isolated from non-poor whites in terms of neighborhoods. Okay, that's really though an individual level kind of activity space movement. I'd like to now argue for a more structural perspective where the aim to, is to look at the extent to which neighborhoods are connected by this everyday movement, where the unit is really the neighborhood where you're connecting and then creating measures, new measures, for the entire city or perhaps metropolitan area, which I think motivates a new class of measures and questions. I'm not going to go through all of this in detail, just note a few papers that come out of this. Uh, one was a theoretical effort in urban studies, uh, neighborhood effects and beyond, explaining the paradoxes of inequality in the changing American metropolis. But the first methodological uh, piece that puts forth the uh, sort of the methodological paradigm was in sociological methods and research, the social integration of American cities. And what we did is to conceptualize mobility networks in two ways. Um, one is, again, neighborhoods as the vertices or nodes, for those of you uh, who are network aficionados. And secondly, the edges or travels between neighborhoods um, right, are, are the way that we're, we're measuring the network. And we calculated two figures. One was, or, or measures, one was concentrated mobility, which is basically a Gini index which quantifies the concentration of common visitation. Why? Because in many cities, there's either the aspiration or the reality of people gathering in spots like parks or maybe museum areas or entertainment areas. Eli Anderson, the sociologist, argues for the idea of a cosmopolitan canopy, areas of the city where people are drawn to, people from different economic race, class type. So um, that may be a utopian kind of ideal, but Actually, you know, if you think about Central Park in New York and other areas of cities around the world, um, there are places or the public commons, and we can measure that. Secondly, is the e Equitable Mobility Index, which takes each neighborhood and is comparing to every other neighborhood in the city. And it essentially, statistically, what it does is quantify how much the, connect, the connections that you observe between neighborhoods would have to be altered such that there is equal travel based on the, dis, you know, the original distribution to all neighborhoods. It ranges from zero to one. Um, we use the Hamming distance to, to calculate that. And so it's a structural measure for the city or the metropolitan area. And those papers, um, again, that the measures and so forth are in that one paper. We've applied this to the study of violence. Um, in one paper, for example, we showed that the cities with the highest violence were really cities that were cleave in the sense of they didn't have these common spaces of, of visitation and they had low equitable mobility. And these are not the same things. And when you get that quadrant of kind of isolated um, cities, places like Detroit and a few others, and, and we show the map, um, those seem to have the highest rates of violence. And then furthermore, we calculated for each city, large city in the United States, and these measures are available public the racial segregation of mobility, that is the equitable mobility index we first published was just all movement, but then we broke it down by racial um, type. So we can actually think about a new measure of racial segregation that's based on non-residents, that is to say, this racially segregated mobility of everyday life. It's not the same thing as residential segregation, though, as you might expect, it is positively related. And we show where it's more strongly related and where it's more weakly related. And it's, an, I think, an interesting finding that sort of American cities, anyway, with r legacies of racial inequality, um, have much higher, um, or in high uh, minority populations, have a much higher level of racially segregated everyday mobility. All right, uh, two more sets of findings, and then we'll leave some time for discussion. Another set of projects um, is looking not so much at the network structure of the overall city, but a new kind of measure 
in theory, really, of neighborhoods in the sense of their characteristics. So everyone in the room really is probably familiar with theories of disadvantage and concentrated poverty, but pretty much every study has looked at the characteristics of those neighborhoods that are, you know, well, how does concentrated disadvantage of a neighborhood affect the residents? But we can also think about urban mobility and how that affects disadvantage. And I use a conceptual framework, and this was published in the American Sociological Review. Imagine three hypothetical neighborhoods in a city. First, you have uh, just define it by class, disadvantaged neighborhoods, middle-class neighborhoods that are in light gray, and advantaged neighborhoods in, in white, and then kind of cross-classify that with mobility patterns. And what we did is to calculate in degree and out degree, that is to say, flows of movement from residents of a neighborhood to other neighborhoods in a city, and we weighted you know, sort of the average, based on travel flows, the average of the disadvantage of the neighborhoods visited. Similarly, we can look at in degree or flows into a city, sort of ambient population in the street. And it's always, you know, I've always wondered about this in my entire career. It's like, well, we're studying neighborhood characteristics, but we know that in any given neighborhood, it's differentially distributed. Sometimes there's a lot of people in a neighborhood that don't live there. And so we can characterize not the characteristics of the people, but at least the characteristics of the neighborhoods from which they come. So consider then neighborhood A, which we, define as triple disadvantage, it's poor, it's disadvantaged, low income, high rates of unemployment and so forth. Uh, we can talk about the measurement later, but it really doesn't matter which specific poverty measure we use. But what's unique about this neighborhood is that its residents disproportionately or only visit other neighborhoods of type B, which are similarly disadvantaged. On top of that, they are visited by disproportionately or only residents of neighborhood B that is disadvantaged. So they, therefore they are poor, visited by resi uh, residents from other poor neighborhoods and are only visiting poor. That's a different kind of social isolation or social um, disadvantage, if you will. And then you can see various combinations. Here you have a middle-class neighborhood where you have a flow to a poor neighborhood. So that's kind of an out disadvantage but we don't want to forget the other end. And we all know neighborhoods like this, right? These are the more elite neighborhoods. Not only are they advantaged, but in this case, there's a lot of movement, if not only to other advantaged neighborhoods. And similarly, um, the visitation flows go too. So I think you, you get the point and you can calculate this then for the entire network of the city, calculate the disadvantage of measures. We did this for 50 American cities and this is just a map of New York for those of you um, who, you know, many people know New York's the largest city. So I thought I'd just show you what a disadvantage map looks like. And you can see strong concentrations of disadvantage in the, in the Bronx, for those of you who know it, and here in Brooklyn and uh, Bedford Stuyvesant Bushwick along Queens area here. When you look at triple disadvantage though, and you can see this, kind of, I just circled it with the arrow, all of a sudden you see a thinning out. And entire areas of, of deep poverty here disappear. In other words, they're not characterized by triple, triple disadvantage. So it really is telling us something different about a city. And this varies across cities. The Bronx really isn't changing much. And if I showed you all cities, you'd see different kinds of patterns. It's more strongly related in some cities, less strongly related in others. Finally, we can then look at, and I'll just show you briefly, does it matter? Well, we think it does. And we showed in the ASR article that neighborhood disadvantage provides added value in terms of predicting homicides in this case, independent of the traditional suspects. I won't get into the long list of controls. Uh, this is the, I think, 99 to uh, first percentile um, conditional uh, relationship. And you can see, particularly at the upper end, this uh, with little boxes, triple disadvantage. And overall, it's predicting um, more homicides, about 45% higher if you compare the 99 to one gap. So it's a significant added value over traditional disadvantage. If you go back to Chicago, where I've done a lot of my research, here you can see this map plots triple disadvantage across the city of Chicago and then overlays homicides proportional to um, the population. You immediately see concentration of homicide. A lot of places have none or very few, but it overlays triple disadvantage 
And then when you do a multivariate regression, that holds up. But what's interesting here, and I, we just published this two months ago in the University of Chicago Law Review, got the latest data, you may know in the United States, violence is going up. But there's a great deal of stability in the structure of the relationship. 2019-20 showed, I think, a 30 to 50 percent increase in homicide. Yet, the structure is the same. Hence, at least I would argue theoretically, the enduring association of triple neighborhood disadvantage with deadly violence. And then when you look at the multivariate predictions, again, you see this added value. Okay. I'm um, going to move on now, just a couple more things. It's implied in what I'm saying, but one thing I'd like you to take away is that this helps us explain some of the racial disadvantage that exists. So if you look at predominantly white neighborhoods, this is a, a box plot, which is showing the interquartile range, sort of the, where the 50% distribution lies of white neighborhoods on triple disadvantage. And then you compare it to other neighborhoods. Wow. You can see like, for example, compared to predominantly black neighborhoods, it's really a difference of kind. There's very little overlap, few outliers overlap, but for the most part, we're talking about different social and economic worlds. Again, based on triple disadvantage, which you don't really see, or we haven't seen in prior research. And in fact, if you do the concept, just neighborhood disadvantage, the ratio of black to white is much lower than when you look at triple disadvantage. So again, it suggests a new layer um, of inequality that we should take seriously. Finally, uh, talk a little bit about other characteristics and other data. Um, the last uh, minute or two here. Uh, in science advances in the last uh, or three months ago, we published a paper looking at COVID and we believe that triple disadvantage and mechanisms such as social control and mask enforcement and so forth are relevant. We use SafeGraph, which is a new Newer method of cell phone mobility, I'm sure you're talking a lot about it. We can talk about the details, but basically it's based on pings from cell phones. Totally different population, obviously. It has different qualities than, than tweets. Um, 45 million cell phones, I believe it is, and we did three places where we could get COVID data, Wisconsin, San Francisco, and King County. This was just published and basically showed that in a very different phenomenon, not homicide, the triple disadvantage, again, based on this uh, cell phone data has independent effects, um, particularly in San Francisco and um, in Seattle, King, King County, basically. Um, and I won't go over the details here, but high mobility disadvantage is very predictive, but also low or more wealthy um, neighborhoods, that is sort of triple advantage neighborhoods in all three places. In Wisconsin, it's really triple advantage, it's important. In San Francisco and Seattle, it, it's all three. And you can kind of see it in this picture on the right. This is just San Francisco, where you have low, middle, and high. Uh, the ratio of high or triple disadvantage to residential neighborhood disadvantage you can really see that predictive power. Finally, I mentioned earlier about, you know, Twitter. Uh, we used it early on, and I was somewhat suspicious of it. But, you know, at the end of the day, Kind of surprised if you just do the correlation of in degree disadvantage over five years. So in other words, lots happening, right? In terms of change. But if you just look, use our Twitter measure and look at all neighborhoods in the 50 largest cities and then compare it to the cell phone in degree, it's a correlation like 0.9 or something like that. Um, yeah, you're not getting exact same values, but we don't seem to be making radically different inferences. Okay, gonna end. I think the argument here is that mobility-based connectedness is a new perspective on city-level uh, social structure. And then particularly, I've shown that neighborhood triple disadvantage, I think is a, is a concept that's important and can be applied to other uh, phenomena as an indep independent predictor of crime and well-being, multiple phenomena. And I think uh, some of my postdocs and people are exploring this more, but we're excited about that direction in research. But in this international conference, I want to end on this point, which is, I'd like to think that this research has implications for what I consider a new comparative ecometrics for public health and well-being more generally. Now, what do I mean by that? In Great American City and in work earlier in the 90s, particularly in collaboration with Stephen Roundbush, we put out the idea of 
ecometrics. It had both statistical, but also statistical um, underpinnings in the following sense that we have standardized systematic metrics for individual characteristics, the whole tradition of psychometrics in, in American psychology and, and beyond. But our idea is that we need a systematic, reliable procedure for or metrics for the study of ecology, so hence ecometrics. And I think with the explosion of data that you're talking about at the conference, and it's not just cell phone data, but other kinds of data, that we can hopefully move toward more consensus and agreed upon measures of characteristics and ecometrics that can be used to assess, uh, predict um, public health and well-being more generally. I mean, I think it's it's good for causal research, but it's good for descriptive research. It's good for um, kind of warning signs in terms of emergent phenomena like COVID. I mean, in our COVID paper, one of the things we argued was that even if it's not, quote, causal, you can quickly identify which places we're likely to see high COVID rates. So in a paper forthcoming in, I, I think, a few months uh, with a postdoc, Jennifer Candapan, we wrote a paper on a comparative network approach to the study of neighborhood and city level inequality based on ur everyday urban mobility. And so here, really, I think, you know, whether it's Mumbai or London, Sao Paulo, Nairobi, you know, my research is based on the United States and can't do everything. <laughs> In fact, it's mostly Chicago, and it's taken me 25 years to do that. But I'm really excited about a more global approach, and I hope um, that is useful and, and, and perhaps we'll give folks some ideas on that. So uh, I'm going to end, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have shared uh, some of my research with you. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you so much for this uh, terrific and, and uh, clear presentation of mobility inequalities as well as the sort of structural um, uh, reasons and, and uh, phenomena behind it. Um, we're going to open up for some Q&A. I think we have about 10 minutes um, in total. Um, and I'd like to maybe just lead us in with one um, question off the bat, which is, when, when you've looked at the 50 largest American cities um, and the interneighborhood mobility dynamics so far, is there anything in the research so far um, that points to uh, spatial characteristics of cities that tend to foster uh, more equality when it comes to uh, interneighborhood mobility? Is there, are, are, are these patterns in your mind uh, largely determined by social demographic uh, factors, or is there anything in the structure of cities that that results in some cities producing more equal um, cross-class, cross-race uh, mobility dynamics than others? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, I think this is kind of a frontier of research in this area. So if you think about it, um, one thing that I have not done in the uh, research I, I've showed you here is really discuss what are the spatial patterns within the city. So for example, if you're traveling within say New York city and you are, say you live in a poor neighborhood and you travel, um, you know, throughout Brooklyn or, or Queens, even though, you know, again, you're coming from a poor neighborhood and you compare that to a person who lives in Chicago, let's say in a poor neighborhood on the so South side, the Chicago person has to travel through more poor neighborhoods, let's say, to get to, um, you know, wherever they're going because the, the, there's large expanses of contiguous segregated areas. So in other words, the spatial and segregated structure within cities, I think does make a difference. And um, this has been shown in other urban mobility studies, for example, um, Mario Small, uh, colleague, was looking at um, travel like to banks and so forth if you live in a poor neighborhood. And it varies a lot across cities. So I think you're absolutely right. And that I think we need to look more at land use. One thing we have done is to look at the, um, the structure and residential segregation in that one paper in urban studies that looks at the racially segregated mobility and then compares it to the residential segregation and then compares that in turn to other characteristics, we see, for example, that just the size of the minority population seems to depress cross uh, race contact. Um, and that's a kind of a group size, uh, perhaps a group threat 
um, you know, mechanism. We talk about that, but um, I think looking at land use and the characteristics of neighborhoods that are pe that people are visiting. The other thing is, I didn't mention it, but we did control in the triple disadvantage analysis for spatial proximity. So obviously if you live in a poor neighborhood or a, let's say a white neighborhood, at least in the US, because of segregation, you're more likely to live next door to another neighborhood that's also you know, of similar characteristics, let's say white or well-to-do. So it could be that the travel patterns we see are affected by that. But in, you know, when we control for spatial proximity and triple disadvantage, we still see this effect. So what it suggests is that it's not just mobility nearby, but it's also mobility um, throughout the metropolis that's, that's segregated. But I do think that that's an important, um, as I said, frontier for future research is to understand more how land use patterns, housing patterns. We did, by the way, again, we controlled for this. We have transportation and the um, uh, controls and density and the size of the city and so forth. We tried to do that, but uh, we certainly did not complete uh, that to at least my satisfaction. So I think you've identified a really important thrust of where research should be going. Great. Um, I'd love to open it up. So please raise your hand if you have a question and there should be a second mic going around for those of you who do. Frank has a question up here. I can pass, well, I, I, there's a second one coming, so. Yes, uh, Frank Whitlock's Ghent University and also uh, University of Tartu. So first of all, thank you for an excellent presentation. So I uh, really enjoyed it. If I were to take the, let's say, the, the view from a policymaker, so what would be one of the, the key things that I should focus on in order to maybe try to solve the triple disadvantage? What would be the key advantage here? Wow, yeah, that's, that's a tough question. And I'm going to show you that I'm not a policy analyst. Um, I don't know. I think, though, that, look, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in just, uh, you know, in the initial research, descriptive patterns, first of all, are important. Um, so laying out the phenomenon and being able to show that we can't just be um, concerned only with concentration of poverty. So if I'm a policymaker, what would I do? I might say something like, we have limited resources. And if we're allocating those resources just based on the residential disadvantage, we're going to be doing an inequitable job in providing resources to neighborhoods that are truly disadvantaged, that is triply disadvantaged. And if you think about it, um, in, in, you know, in the triple disadvantage paper, I, I didn't have time to get into it, but we talk about mechanisms, like what's going on in some of these neighborhoods? Well, they tend to be neighborhoods that not just have ambient population, but certain kinds of ambient population. So there's potentially more, let's say, drug dealers coming into the city so that, uh, or into those neighborhoods, so they're more vulnerable. Or um, gun distribution networks. Gun concentration, particularly in the United States, is highly uneven and concentrated and gun violence recently has gone up uh, considerably. So if we just use the old models and said, well, we know that poverty is related to guns or let's say drug dealing to the extent that it is in cities and, and we allocate resources based on that, we are going to miss the hot spots that are, are truly um, driving the action. So I think in that sense, it just provides a new window uh, on which to think about uh, either allocation of resources or allocation of maybe um, patrol patterns. I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of downsides to thinking about police uh, interactions in, in these communities. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be police, could be public health. So, for example, um, in COVID, you know, providing early warning signs, providing masks, providing uh, more uh, health-based interventions or drug overdoses. That's another thing that some of these communities with high triple disadvantage are seeing um, very high rates of 
um, not just homicide, but other uh, crimes or f public health issues. So for example, if we're seeing a high overdose, we could um, send public, we could allocate public health resources uh, more efficiently and rationally. So that's just one quick way that I would think about it. Um, there are others, I'm sure, um, in terms of interventions that people in epidemiology and public health and criminology and policing uh, could do a better job. But um, I do think that there are, uh, sure, there are, um, I think, direct implications for policy. And that's just one. Great. Is there any last question? I know we're uh, running slightly over time here, but we can take one more question if there is one. Yes, let's run on this side of the room. Yeah, I also would like to thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, um, I was wondering, because maybe I, I, I didn't get that really, is did you analyze the, uh, the in, in your research, do you analyze in which way people actually are uh, traveling and which neighbors they are visiting? Or also, are you also looking at the objective accessibility? So what the opportunities of people might be if you look at, like for instance, the mobility network. And is there a difference between them? Um, okay, to make sure I understand the question. Yeah, so we're looking, pinpointing the neighborhood of residence or home location, and then each neighborhood, in this case a block group or a census tract in, let's say, the commuting zone or metropolitan area of the city or other cities. So we are looking at the exact ties based on uh, visitation um, to, to each of those neighborhoods, yes. And uh, what we did not do, and I'm not sure if this is the question, but um, in terms of what people are doing in those neighborhoods. And I think that's a limitation of mobility research. And I, I think, or I hope some people in the conference are addressing this in terms of the different um, the things that people do when they go outside their neighborhoods, shopping, leisure, visiting friends, um, work, and so forth. There's a lot of different reasons that people are going to different neighborhoods. And other than the, let's say the race and the class characteristics, things like um, the concentration of, of employment or, or things like that, we, we did not look at. So yes, we looked at the exact uh, mobility network, um, but not what people were doing. But I'm not sure that's answering your question. So um, well, if, if I, I was trying, please. if if we look at, at a mobility network or in transportation, we are looking at opportunities. So how much jobs can I reach within a certain time? Uh, how much mm -hmm. grocery stores, et cetera, et cetera. That's yeah, yeah. like looking at okay. it in, in yeah, terms of opportunities, in terms of, or is it like people are actually doing, there can be a difference, of course. And so if you yes, look at yes. the triple at disadvantage, where do you have to put your policy in? Is it in... The broadening the opportunities, or is it actually trying to change behavior in the sense of uh, grasping those opportunities and let, let that work? Yeah. Yeah, I see. I mean, that's a great question. And I think the transportation research community has a lot to offer here. So, no, I mean, we really don't know. For example, uh, theoretically, yes, like, okay, there's, it's assumed that there's a greater opportunity structure, let's say, in um, more advantaged neighborhoods. But we don't look at, let's say, the number of jobs or the opportunity structures that are there. And I think that's, that's another kind of frontier of, of research. And I mean, it's related to what I was saying about, you know, we're not getting at what people are doing or really that opportunity structure. And another thing, by the way, transportation research was ahead of the game, in my view, in terms of looking at this in the following way. One strategy, I think, that we haven't done would be to consider this in, in a kind of discrete choice model. That is to say, if you live in a neighborhood and then you have every you know, neighborhood or you have a choice set of neighborhoods and then um, look at all the characteristics of the sort of the opportunity structure and the, the characteristics of all the possible neighborhoods you could visit and then see how those are related to the, the neighborhoods you actually visit. And I think maybe that's kind of where you're going is that we could get a better handle on looking at the different, whether it's, you know, jobs or the racial composition or econ um, 
economic composition, land use, grocery stores, banks. What is drawing people? What is really kind of behind some of the flows? That is, yes, I think a, an important agenda for research. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you for that. And, and just as a side note, um, Rob, we actually just uh, last year published a paper on exactly that, using safe graph data with a discrete choice model for destination choice. And uh, it's certainly a, a super interesting area uh, to pursue further. Um, and it's wonderful to hear about Chicago. I, I actually personally just got back from Juneteenth on the South Side and, and experienced these uh, amazing inequalities uh, firsthand as as much of your research also shows. So uh, please, um, let's give another round of applause and we thank you so much for connecting to us. Thank you, thank you.